I'm Eric Schatzker. Take a seat in the front row for my exclusive interview with Apollo Global Management co-founder, Josh Harris. Josh, I'm glad we're doing this. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Eric. Josh, crises are defining events. <clears throat> How do you think this crisis, the, the pandemic, um, is going to redefine the economy, financial markets, politics perhaps, and maybe even our whole society. Eric, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I remember uh, 1987 sitting on a trading floor in the middle of a, a large investment bank and watching the market plummet 500 points. Uh, I remember then going to, um, you know, through 1990 and the start of Apollo, uh, and then 2001, 2008, and now, you know, this crisis, and this is a much more deep, uh, more difficult crisis. It started with a health crisis, uh, and, you know, people are dying, uh, have died, they've gotten sick. It then went to uh, a, um, you know, economic crisis, and we've got 14% uh, unemployment, and now uh, we're getting to, uh, you know, a social unrest, and, you know, really an outcry uh, with the murder of George Floyd against the systemic racism that's occurring in our country. And so for all of those reasons, is a very difficult crisis, and I think it is going to redefine uh, many, many things. I think it'll be a while before we have mass gatherings. Uh, I think you're going to need to find a cure. I think ultimately we'll get back to that. But clearly, I think, um, you know, there's going to be a focus on uh, discrimination and racism and inequality in this country. And that could, you know, redefine the political landscape. Uh, and, and then uh, you'll, you'll probably see a lot of pressure on taxes, uh, on, 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 you know, kind of uh, income inequality. And so I think that uh, th those are all going to change uh, how we live together, how we uh, engage together, how we work together. I think, in, and I, what I'm hoping is that you can you know, create some positive change out of this. And I think all of us as business leaders, it's incumbent on us to speak out, uh, to speak up and to you know, take actions that allow for uh, particularly the income inequality that exists in this country, as well as the uh, racism that exists to, to make positive change and to eliminate as much of that as we can. So you see the changes that we feel are happening now <clears throat> as, as not transient changes, that some of these things are going to be lasting changes. This will just accelerate it, it'll turbocharge it. And it's a call to action for all of us that you know, I run a number of organizations, a call to action for all of us to not only speak out, of course we have to speak out, but we have to do more than that. We have to take actions. And so we're in the middle of uh, doing a lot of that. And let's face it, in many cases, particularly in terms of the racism that exists in this country, we failed. We as business leaders, we as uh, leaders, and we failed. We have not done enough and we need to do more. So take action how? You know, it's everything from, uh, you know, how you hire and who's in leadership positions and politically, you know, what your priorities are, uh, how you spend your money, what organizations you give to, to, um, you know, to putting, to it being issues focused around um, making sure that there's, transparency uh, in terms of hiring practices and, um, you know, it's, it's many, many things. How long does it take the economy to properly recover? And when I'm talking about properly recovering, I mean for companies, right, whose revenue and EBITDA have vanished, right, to become profitable again. Are we talking about a year? Are we talking about two years? Are we talking about five years? Let me give you some historical context that's going to be different for every industry, but for the economy at large, um, if you, unemployment today is 14% ish. 
uh, that 70% of the economy is driven by consumer spending. Uh, consumers, right, 15% of consumers in this country are unemployed. 15% are worried about their jobs. And then 40% of consumer spending is people that are over 55 years of age. And so all of those groups are impaired. They're not feeling confident. They're not spending. And so um, when I put that in con historical context, the uh, financial crisis that occurred in 2008, unemployment uh, reached just over 10%. Uh, it took about three years. It took from till about 2010, 2011 for the economy to recover where it was before the financial crisis in 2007. And so that would be one bookend in the Great Depression where uh, unemployment reached 25%, so well above where we are today. Uh, it took about seven years. And so as I think about the bookends, I think that we're somewhere between three and seven years. And I would just say, when you look at the stock market, and we haven't gotten to markets yet, but I'm sure we will, the stock market is building in a return to the 2019 GDP uh, earnings, to earnings in 2021. That's the median estimate. The estimates are all over the place, but the median estimate is that 2021 is the same as 2019. And uh, we, we, we at Apollo um, don't really, we think that is aggressive. Uh, we don't see that, we think the markets are a little bit divorced from the fundamental economy and, and, and what we're seeing in our underlying portfolio. And therefore we believe that um, that's a little too aggressive and we're underwriting things uh, depending on the industry at sort of four or five, even six year recovery trend. You're not a macro hedge fund, you're principally a credit <clears throat> investor, but based on what you just told me, if you were, would you be shorting the stock market? I would not be shorting the stock market. And certainly we do look at the stock market in, this, in the following sense. I think that what's driving the stock market today is the massive amount of government response, particularly the Fed's quantitative easing, the monetary authorities all over the world. If you think about it, uh, during the financial crisis, the Fed expanded its balance sheet about $3 trillion. In the last, that was the 10 years around the financial crisis. In the last two and a half months, the Fed has expanded its balance sheet about $2.6 trillion. And it has $3 trillion more that it can spend on securities based on the Treasury's authorization. And so it, it's put massive amounts of liquidity into the market. And if you look at the stock market, it tends to correlate to, it, it, we've actually tracked the correlation between the stock market and central bank balance sheets, and it's very high. It's actually about 90%, which is a staggering number. And so what's driving the market is that the dividend, the earnings yields, if you take the inverse of the PE, um, and you compare that to treasuries that are under 1%, you have a seven or 800 basis point difference. You've got about 6% earnings yield versus negative 1% real rate on a 10 year treasury. If you take the treasuries and you subtract the projected inflation rate, you're somewhere between negative zero and negative one. And so that discrepancy forces money managers to have a large allocation in stocks. And that's what's driving the stock market it's, it, it's what's being left behind at this point. It's a battle between technical and, and technicals and so, fundamentals. What's being left behind is fundamentals. Well, the question, I, I think, you tell me otherwise if you disagree ultimately, is if you're right and the outlook for the economy is more dismal than it was after the financial crisis, can that last? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of risk in the stock market today. I think that number one, earnings, as I talked about. Number two, no one knows um, the, the US and China, um, you know, may very well decouple. And the relationship between those two parties being stable is, is very important to the world. And then number three, um, you've got the pandemic. Um, and we're still not out of the woods as to 
you know, second level effects or a, a kick up in, you know, some of the pandemic. And, and then you have the political environment, which is very volatile and very um, not necessarily helpful. So I think all those things, you know, could affect the stock market. Um, and so the real question is how long will the government intervention go on? And so mm -hmm. usually it's the old adage, don't fight the Fed. And right now the Fed is signaling they're all in, they're gonna do what it takes. And so fundamentals are being overwhelmed, but certainly as an investor, uh, as a fundamentally based value investor, which we are, and if you're out there looking at the stock market, you have to really ask yourself, uh, when does the Fed uh, get tired of supporting the market? And, and the market will at that point really go down unless fundamentals vastly pick up. And that's a harder thing to predict. But I think on the other side of that, um, this could go on for a long time. I, I think low rates are gonna be very low for a very long time. You could have 10 years of low rates. And so you kind of don't necessarily want to be short the stock market, but you want to be aware that it's overvalued on a fundamental basis and be, and be a little bit more introspective. From our point of view, uh, we're able to go off the market. We're the largest a private lender and we're the second largest private equity player. So we're able to go out of the way of the public markets, get into the private markets, go off the run and generate vastly superior risk return opportunities for our clients who are pension funds, uh, teachers, policemen, firemen. And, and, and so that for us is how we remedy uh, what we see as the overvaluation of the public markets. Well, that raises a question for me. Traditionally, Josh, an economic collapse of this magnitude <coughs> creates opportunities for investors like Apollo. Yep. I wonder, has the Fed deprived you of that opportunity by acting with such extraordinary speed and force to restore confidence? So we have a vast platform, Eric. We have 350 billion of assets today and we have uh, many, many um, opportunities to be the lifeline to uh, companies uh, all over the U.S. and all over the world, and it's every and so the Fed money certainly has has made it harder. But um, since we're generally off the run, uh, we're, we've been able to really get involved. And so, for example, uh, Main Street, the Main Street program at the Fed, has, you know, the the restrictions on that program, you know, it hasn't really been as effective as some of the other programs and. Many, many companies, and they've done a great job. So I don't, I don't mean to denigrate what they've done. They've done an incredible job. But you know, there's, we're lending to companies that have 20 million of EBITDA, that have 50 million of EBITDA. Uh, we're lending to um, you know, restaurants, but, you know, franchise finance, structured credit, uh, people that own stores. Um, so so the opportunities you thought were going to materialize have, in fact, materialized. They haven't been, you know, uh, displaced by, well, been, uh, by Fed stimulus? It's been affected by it, but we spent over 50, we bought $50 billion of debt uh, in the first month and a half of the crisis. And, you know, and we lent some of the bigger things we lent to companies like Expedia, world-class companies, companies like Albertson, mm -hmm. world-class companies, you know, very large supermarket chain. And, 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 and they had access to other liquidity, but for example, um, they didn't necessarily want to have the restrictions uh, that might have been on some of the Fed money. And, but, but most of what we're doing is below, you know, the Federal Reserve is doing a lot of stuff with government bonds. Mm -hmm. It's doing a lot of stuff with triple A's. It's doing some stuff buying the high yield index, but most of what we do is 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 private is 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 below the size of those things and is a little bit lesser credit quality and so the banks have been in essence uh regulated in a way that they no longer uh provide as much of the credit as they did and so players like Paul, oh, we're the largest one with the biggest credit platform we're able to step in and, um, and, and, and sort of play the role of the lender that the banks used to be. And our investors, our clients, 
who need us to be agile, who need us to be on point during this type of, of, of a volatile environment, uh, they're finding us. We, we're raising in excess of $20 billion right now. Uh, and we have 30 plus billion of liquidity because we're at the, the nexus of you know, what's going on in credit right now away from the Federal Reserve. Your firm has investments in some industries hard hit by the COVID-19 virus. I'm thinking of airlines, for example. I'm thinking of resorts, <coughs> fast food, some energy. How badly are those investments struggling right now? And what have you had to do to bolster them, buttress them, if you will? We have a watch list and only 5% of our portfolio is on that watch list. And of that 5%, we think that many of those companies uh, are, are gonna be fine. And so, yes, yeah, certainly uh, we have a little bit of energy and a little bit of retail, but um, we're in very good shape. And we're now able to do what we've done in past uh, recessions, past crises, and be very agile and nimble and shift to buying uh, good companies with bad balance sheets. Uh, the financing markets today for alternatives, even though the high yield market may be open, um, the bank markets are not very open and the availability of financing to do more traditional buyouts is closed. So most of the industry is really working on a portfolio that's in much worse shape. And also they're not able to do what they do, which is traditional buyouts. In our case, a third of what we've done over the years is this buying good companies, uh, buying the, the senior secured debt at the top of the, of the capital structure, and then going through the restructuring process. And sometimes you need to go through a restructuring process to preserve jobs. If there's too much debt, you need to get rid of that debt. And we've had a demand shock. And so 100% of what we've been doing is, 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 is playing, uh, is, is buying that debt now and trying to work through the restructuring. And we're playing about 95% offense, Eric. And so, you know, this is our time. You know, this is when uh, our investors expect us to be a safe pair of hands and to be able to be agile and nimble and weave through uh, crises like this. And this is where we've outperformed and I feel very proud of our team. And I think we continue to do that. What do you mean, expand if you will, on this is our time? What does that mean? What's the Apollo <clears throat> playbook for this crisis and how is it different from what other firms in your business do? So the playbook, first of all, is to take care of your people, but then you know, once you do that and you take care of the environment in which you're operating, um, you go <clears throat> into um, really acquiring uh, senior secured debt, acquiring debt uh, across, you know, of companies or lending to companies that are in need and um, making, and, and at the same time, looking for those risk return opportunities that are uh, creating superior risk return for your clients. And We've done that cycle after cycle. We've, we've been in business 30 years. This is our 30th year anniversary. And in every cycle we've outperformed, we were probably the second most active or the most active buyer um, in the financial crisis. Uh, and, and we're doing the same here. And so that is in, in essence, the Apollo playbook. And you know the, the culture of the place, the integration between private equity and credit the vast size of the platform enable us to find opportunities where other people um, aren't looking. And because we were um, ready for this in terms of our portfolio and we were conservatively positioned, we're not bogged down. Uh, what kinds of returns, Josh, do you think <clears throat> you'll be able to generate with the investments that you've made since this crisis began and the ones that you plan to make and will they be superior to the ones that you were able to generate after the financial crisis? Right, so most of the firm, right, is now yield-based. It's mm -hmm. not what we call opportunistic. And so, you know, you've got it across the spectrum. We're, we're in essence helping companies or lending to companies or buying securities that might uh, be you know, single A, double A, uh, even triple B, all the way down to um, securities that are, are sort of more equity-based uh, distressed securities. And I would say that 
um, you know, in, 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 in sort of the higher credit quality asset classes, the investment grade securities, um, you know, we're able to uh, generate, uh, you know, 50 basis points to three or 400 basis points of excess return, depending on the um, situation in terms of the more opportunistic stuff. Um, if um, we're, we're much more focused on absolute return and we have funds that are generating, you know, between, you know, over 15 and even uh, over 20% if you go into our private equity funds where we're in essence buying uh, debt, but we're going to convert that to equity securities. Um, so we'll be in excess of 20%. Our overall returns in private equity have been in the high 30s. Um, it's really hard to predict that in the context of, um, you know, the, the current environment today. Uh, but I think we'll be well over 20%. People still marvel at the $10 billion that Apollo made on Lionel Bissell after the financial crisis. It's been described as one of the ballsiest trades ever. It certainly was one of the most profitable trades ever, more than 5X. Is there another Lionel Bissell lurking out there, or is this crisis kind of different from that crisis? No, there's a lot of big companies that are over levered. I'd say the speed of the government response. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, it felt like it was going to be more like the financial crisis, but the massive speed of the government response has so far, and, you know, we're still in the middle of this, um, you know, not created the, the gap down that existed in the financial crisis. And, and so it'll depend on what happens with the pandemic. It'll depend on, you know, the action of the Federal Reserve and the federal government in terms of fiscal stimu stimulus, it'll depend on what happens between US and China and the economy. And so um, we're busy at work, uh, you know, whether there's, an, it, whether there's another Lionel Bazell uh, remains to be seen. <laughs> uh, Apollo grew approximately 6X, right? Some $270 billion in assets under management from the end of 2009 to the end of 2019. Does it grow by six decks again over the next 10 years? We think that it's gonna double over the next five years and then probably double again. You know, So I think uh, obviously the law of large, large numbers, um, you know, six X uh, from a lower base is probably three to four X uh, from this base um, over 10 years. Uh, but we have an enormous amount of opportunity uh, in terms of you know, our differentiation as um, a platform that has uh, you know, massive permanent capital. 65% uh, of what we do is, permanent, has, is now permanent capital. Uh, we have you know, significant growth platforms in uh, our insurance uh, clients and, and, and partners, uh, Thien, Athora in Europe, uh, they continue to um, be able to, they're very well capitalized and they're very well managed and very conservatively run. And so <clears throat> in this environment, they continue to see significant opportunities and you know, we're, we are able to manage those assets and generate excess returns for them. It's a very symbiotic relationship and then, you know, we generate superior returns. We generate superior returns in our, um, in our private equity business. We generate superior returns in our credit businesses. And as a result, money tends to find us. And so our, you know, our client business away from our permanent capital business, our traditional alternatives business is also growing. And let's face it, alternatives is a good business. Uh, more and more people are saying, um, okay, I have all this money in the public markets, the returns are very low, government bonds yield 1%, um, that's forcing investment grade bonds to three or 4%. I don't, that's not enough for me as a pension fund. That's not enough for me as a money manager. I need six or 8%. Is that trajectory to three or four times where you are now over the next decade or so, a matter of doing more 
of what you're doing today, more credit, more private equity, more real assets, which is a smaller part of your business? Or do you see room or, or perhaps an attractive opportunity to, to, to broaden the business, to, to go lateral and, and do other things that you're not doing now? Yeah, so I think the uh, growth of three or four X really is just doing uh, more. Uh, but I also think that, I mean, I think the tailwind in our business is going to lead us there. <clears throat> uh, the growth in our insurance class platforms and the growth in our client business is going to lead us to that three or four X. Um, but we're always looking and it would be a great, very good for us to continue to diversify you know, our business. Um, we have uh, many things that we're looking at doing. And, you know, obviously when you're um, trying to broaden your business, you're talking about people. This is mm -hmm. a people business. And, you know, we tend to be value oriented. Uh, you know, we, you know, the employees own, you know, 40 plus percent of Apollo. Uh, the rest is public. So we're, you know, we're eating our own cooking. And so, we look, we're, we look for things that are, are creative over time and we look for great people and great uh, new, new legs, new platforms. You know, we haven't been in, uh, you know, is there an Apollo way to play technology? We're exploring that. Uh, clearly it would have to be uh, pretty low tech, but uh, that's a sector of the economy that is massive, that is growing, that, you know, we would be fools not to be looking at that uh, our real estate business could get bigger. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities for us, but really we're, we're, we're lucky. We can just, we can get to that three to four X just doing what we're doing now. And it's about execution, continuing to, <clears throat> you know, to invest, find those great uh, opportunities and, and generate the attractive risk return opportunities for our clients. The U.S. <laughs> Department of Labor has opened the door for private equity to become part of 401k plans, the retirement savings of everyday Americans. Josh, how important will the retail channel become to Apollo's funding mix? Right, so retail is under allocated to alternatives. And the reason that, so the average retail investor is very low single digit, one, two, three percent uh, in alternatives. Um, compare that to the institutional markets, the pension markets, they're 20% and endowments are even higher. And the reason that <clears throat> more sophisticated investors are in alternatives is that the returns are just better. The returns are higher. They have been, they might continue <clears throat> to be. Exactly. So um, this is a democratization of, it's making alternatives available to the common man and the common woman. And so it makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, uh, disclosure and making sure they understand that it's a liquid, you don't get the money back quickly, there can be volatility and so forth. Um, all of that needs to be handled and that's <clears throat> what the uh, regu regulations are trying to sort out. But certainly this is uh, about the size of the institutional market and it, it's gonna be a very large and important leg for alternatives and it's a new, in essence, growth platform. It's a new uh, way for you know, more capital to flow in. And so uh, for sure, it's gonna be a big part of what we do. And we do <clears throat> already access this market through our insurance platforms, uh, Athene and Athora providing insurance to uh, men and women. And uh, also through um, indirectly, obviously, and indirectly through mutual fund complexes and through high net worth channels. But certainly what? this is a growing, growing part of our platform. I have a question for you that, that might feel a little uncomfortable. Those aren't necessarily bad it. things. So Mars. I don't need to tell you that Apollo has a reputation. Of course, I could summarize it, right, with a bunch of adjectives, but I would rather you take a stab at it. Why is it, Josh, that people don't like Apollo? Um, well, look, I think that it's not that people don't like Apollo. When you, you know, we grew out of uh, the rough and tumble uh, we, may, we, we started off uh, in the um, buying good companies with bad balance sheets. We grew up in the rough and tumble distress business. Uh, we're very tenacious. We tend to fight hard for our clients and push hard for that, the returns. And um, we also haven't done the greatest job of telling our story. Uh, and, and, and we've evolved over time to really uh, 
being uh, much more of a, a lender of a you know, provider of capital to the middle market and to small and mid-sized businesses. Um, but, um, you know, we, we need to is, do Is that to say you're trying to, is it, it, you're trying to change the reputation? Yeah, I think we're, we're really, um, you know, we're, we spent a lot of time, we're evolving Apollo to the 21st century. Um, you, know, you know, really caring about our environment, taking care of our people, um, communications. Uh, you know, we, we now are more, you know, when's the last time you saw, uh, you don't used to not see too many people from Apollo on Bloomberg. Uh, <laughs> you know, we need to tell our story and get out there. We're a very large public company now. We're a $22, $23 billion market cap company. And we evolved from a private partnership. And so um, we are the, the values that we hold dear internal at Apollo, which is uh, meritocracy and you know, taking care of our people, taking care of the world at large, taking care of our clients, uh, standing on the right side of diversity and inclusion. Like we need to get out there and tell that story better and we're, tr and we're doing it and this is part of it. But there has to be, and there's no but, those are all admirable goals. Anybody would applaud. The but is that there has to be a reason for it. There has to be a reason you're doing it now because the firm has up until recently been quite comfortable of being out of the limelight and allowing people to form whatever opinions they want, however unfavorable they may have been. What's the reason? I mean, again, I mean, think as you get really significant in size, um, you know, it's incumbent on you to be more transparent. Uh, being a large public company, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of things to make ourselves more visible and more. Um, able to be understood and 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 also more let's face it um you know at, you know the public owns our stock and so it's it starts with everything that we talked about but in, you know we're now uh, being included in indexes uh we've recently been announced that we're going to join the russell we've joined the msci uh, we're making changes to our corporate structure uh to make it uh, more like a widely held pu public company so this is the evolution of what was you know, a small private partnership into a, a large, very significant public company that I think is one of, going to be one of the, you know, large, important entities in the financial service business in the 21st century.